so much for having me. Thank you to the council. It really is a deep pleasure to be here. I'll be talking today uh, about the science of creativity, but I'd like to begin with a story about Bob Dylan. It's a story that takes place early in the summer of 1965 when Dylan is finishing up his tour of England. It's been a grueling few months as Dylan has been struggling to maintain a non-stop performance schedule. He'd first traveled across the Northeast on a bus, playing in small college towns and big city theaters. He'd played five venues in New Jersey alone. Then he crossed over to the West Coast and crammed in a hectic few weeks of concerts and promotion. He'd been paraded in front of the press and asked an endless series of inane questions, from what is the truth to why is there a cat on the cover of your last album? When Dylan wasn't surly, he was often sarcastic, telling journalists that he collected monkey wrenches, was born in Mexico, and that his songs were inspired by chaos, watermelon, and clocks. <laughs> that last line almost made him smile. By the time Dylan arrived in London, it was clear that the tour was taking a toll. The singer was skinny from insomnia and pills, his nails were yellow from nicotine, and his skin had a ghostly pale pallor. Joan Baez said he looked like an underfed angel. Although Dylan's creativity remained a constant, there were increasing signs that he was losing interest in creating music. For the first time, his solo shows felt formulaic, as if he were singing the lines of someone else. He rarely acknowledged the audience or paused between songs. He seemed to be in a hurry to get off stage. Before long, it all became too much. While touring in England, Dylan decided that he was leading an impossible life, that this existence couldn't be sustained. The only talent he cared about, his ceaseless creativity, was being ruined by fame. The breaking point probably came after a brief vacation in Portugal where Dylan came down with food poisoning. The illness forced him to stay in bed for a week, giving him a rare chance to reflect. I realized I was very drained, Dylan would later confess. I was playing a lot of songs I didn't want to play. I was singing words I didn't really want to sing. It's very tiring having other people tell you how much they dig you if you yourself don't dig you. The last shows were in London. It was here that Dylan told his manager he was quitting the music business. He was finished with singing and songwriting and was going to move to a tiny cabin in Woodstock, New York. Although Dylan had become a pop icon, the prophetic poet of his generation, he was ready to renounce it all. He just wanted to be left alone. Dylan wasn't bluffing. As promised, he returned from his British tour and rode his Triumph motorcycle straight out of New York City. He didn't even bring his guitar. Of course, our story doesn't end here. Bob Dylan did not retire in 1965. After a few relaxing days in Woodstock, just when Dylan was most determined to stop creating music, he was overcome with the strange feeling. It's a hard thing to describe, Dylan would later remember. It's just this sense that you got something to say. And so Dylan did the only thing he knew how to do. He grabbed a pencil and started to scribble. Once Dylan began, his hand didn't stop moving for the next several hours. I found myself writing this song, this story, this long piece of vomit. 20 pages long, Dylan said. I'd never written anything like that before, and it suddenly came to me that this is what I should do. Vomit is the essential word here. Dylan was describing with characteristic vividness the uncontrollable rush of a creative insight, that flow of associations that can't be held back. I don't know where my songs come from, Dylan said. It's like a ghost is writing a song. It gives you the song and it goes away. You don't know what it means. Once the ghost arrived, all Dylan wanted to do was get out of the way. In retrospect, we can see that this frantic composition allowed Dylan to fully express, for the very first time, the diversity of his influences. In these cryptic lyrics, we can hear his mental blender at work as he mixes together scraps of Blake, Fellini, Woody Guthrie, and Robert Johnson. The song is modernist and pre-modern, avant-garde and country-western. What Dylan did, and this is why he's Bob Dylan, is find the strange thread connecting these different voices. In those first minutes of writing, he found a way to make something new out of the strange list of influences drawing them together into a catchy song. When Dylan gets to the chorus, and he knows this is the chorus as soon as he commits it to paper, the visceral power of the song becomes obvious. How does it feel to be without a home, like a complete unknown, like a rolling stone? 
The following week, on June 15, 1965, Dylan brought his sheaf of papers into the cramped space of Studio A, Columbia Records, in New York City. After just four takes, the musicians were just beginning to learn their parts. Like a Rolling Stone was cut on acetate. Those six minutes of raw music would revolutionize rock and roll. Bruce Springsteen would later describe the experience of hearing the single on the radio as one of the most important moments of his life. The story of Like a Rolling Stone, the reason I'm telling you about Bob Dylan this morning, is because it's a great story of insight. At times, such stories can feel like romantic cliches, the sort of make-believe breakthroughs that happened to Archimedes in the bathtub and Newton under the apple tree. And yet, these insights, these epiphanies, they really do happen. They are a genuine mental event. They really are responsible for the theory of gravity and Like a Rolling Stone. This morning, I'd like to talk briefly about some of the research, some of the new research which has gone into understanding these moments of insight, these shattering epiphanies that, that seem to come out of nowhere. There are two defining features to such moments, and I'm talking primarily here about the research of Mark Beeman at Northwestern and John Cuneos at Drexel, not so far from here. And these two defining features are one, in order to have a moment of insight, the answer has to come out of the blue. It comes when you least expect it. So for Bob Dylan, it only came after he arrived in Woodstock. He, got, he wrote his best song after he quit singing and songwriting. The second defining feature is that as soon as the answer arrives, it feels like the answer. It comes attached with this sense of certainty. It feels like a revelation. Now, if you're a scientist, it's not quite clear how one could study these very mysterious mental moments, as if the cortex is just sharing one of its secrets. You know, you can't just put undergrads in a brain scanner and say, have an epiphany, we're ready for you. You know, that'd be a very inefficient way to collect data. If Bob Dylan wanted to volunteer, you may get somewhere, you know, a little bit more interesting. But, but you know, so instead what scientists had to do was come up with a way to generate lots of moments of insight on the fly. And so their solution, this is the solution pioneered by Beeman and Cuneos, was to give these undergraduates a set of word problems called compound remote associate problems. The acronym is a bit unfortunate, C-R-A-P. But, <laughs> but basically what the word problems are is they consist of three words and you have to find the fourth word that can form a compound word with those three. So we'll do one together. The three words are pine, crab, and sauce. What's the fourth word that can form a compound word with pine, crab, and sauce? In this case, the answer is apple, pineapple, crab apple, applesauce. Here's one for you guys. The three words are age, mile, and sand. What's the fourth word that can form a compound word with age? Just shout it out if you... Stone. So, so if it happened that quick, you almost certainly had a moment of insight. The answer just popped into your head out of the blue. So what Beeman and Cuneos did was they'd give people these compound remote associate problems inside an fMRI machine and then look to see what happened in their brain in the seconds before the epiphany appeared. And what they discovered was a sharp spike in activity in an obscure part of the cortex called the superior interior temporal gyrus. It's a bit of brain in the back of the right hemisphere just behind your ear, and it's a bit of brain nobody knows too much about. It's been previously associated with things like the processing of jokes, it lights up when you hear a punchline, and also the interpretation of metaphors. And, and this makes a little bit of sense, you know, when Romeo declares in Romeo and Juliet that Juliet is the sun, we know he's not saying that Juliet's a big flaming ball of plasma gas. Instead, we realize he's trafficking in metaphor and that he's really saying that Juliet lights up his world the way the sun lights up ours. Now, the way we make sense of that metaphor is to look past all the surface dissimilarities, the fact that Juliet's and sons have literally nothing in common, and instead search for the underlying themes they actually share, those remote associations that allow us to make sense of the lovely line. Now, a similar activity, a similar mental process is required when we're searching for the one word that connects pine, crab, and sauce. Those aren't three words you probably used together in a sentence before. They don't go together a lot. But what this one brain area seems to be so good at is finding the one other word, which in this case is apple, which binds all these words together. So it's able to look past the surface, the jarring dissimilarities on the surface, and instead find that remote association that allows us to find the connection. Now, when we need to solve a very difficult problem, it's often going to require those kinds of remote associations. It's going to require us to bring together a disparate set of connections, a set of objects, things, ideas that, that seem entirely unrelated. And yet, in that blinding flash of insight, in that wonderful, glorious moment, 
we suddenly see the connection. That part of the brain, the superior anterior temporal gyrus, whispers apple, and apple leaps into consciousness. So that's the first thing Beeman and Cunha discovered, is, is the importance of this bit of brain in the back of the right hemisphere. Second thing they discovered, I think, is a bit more interesting. And this was in conjunction with other researchers at the University College of London. And what they discovered is that by hooking people up to EEG machines, these are, it's like wearing a big bulky shower cap. It measures the waves of electricity pouring out of your brain. What they discovered is that they could predict up to eight seconds in advance whether or not someone was going to have a moment of insight. So now just think for a second about how spooky this is. They could look at your EEG waves and they could say, Sorry, buddy, you are wasting your time. You should just go home. You could sit here all day, and you're never going to have a moment of insight. Or they could say, hmm, interesting. In about seven and a half seconds, brace yourself. You're probably going to have an insight. The question, of course, is what this predictive signal is. It turns out to be something called alpha waves. Alpha waves, like most things in the mind, remain very mysterious. But they have been closely associated with states of relaxation. So any place which makes you forget about work, makes you forget about your problems, puts you at ease, those are all places that are going to lead to a surge of alpha waves. So it's taking a walk in a nice park. It's lying on your couch. It's watching TV, drinking a beer. It's taking a warm shower. It's you know going to the beach. Whatever it is that, that makes you feel relaxed that's going to lead to a surge in alpha waves. Now, the reason states of relaxation seem to be so predictive of people having moments of insight is that when we're not relaxed, when we're really vigilant, when we're really focused on the problem, that's where, that's where our attention is. It's fixated on pine crab and sauce, pine crab and sauce, pine crab and sauce. And in many instances, a wrong answer is running like a broken record inside our brain. So a common wrong answer to pine crab and sauce is tree. So you may be fixated on tree, and, and that's all you can think about. It's not until you're relaxed, until you're being pelted by hot water in the shower while shampooing your hair, that you can finally turn the spotlight of attention inwards and hear that quiet voice telling you, the answer's apple, the answer's apple. Maybe that voice has been there for hours, days, weeks, months, who knows? You just haven't taken a second to listen. Now, there is, I think, something rather counterintuitive about this research. I think most people assume that when faced with a really difficult problem, a non-trivial problem, a problem that seems impossible, that what they should do is double down on caffeine. They should chug Red Bull. They should do whatever it is it takes to stay focused on the problem, you know, to chain themselves to their desk, to stare straight ahead at the computer screen, focus, focus, focus. That's, that's what we associate with productivity, with problem solving. But this research suggests that's the exact wrong approach. We will be focused, but we'll just be focused on the wrong answer. Instead, when you hit the wall, when you're stumped like Bob Dylan in May 1965, that's when you should take a break. That's when you should play some ping pong, take a long walk, take a nap, go take a really long shower. The answer will only arrive once you stop looking for it. This reminds me of one of my favorite lines about creativity, which is, comes from Einstein, and he said, Creativity is the residue of time wasted. I think one of the practical lessons from this research is that we all have to get a little bit better at wasting time.